So I am just going to turn it over to her. Nora, I gave you all the capabilities so you can do whatever Let's you need to do. see. How am I going to? Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm not a native Zoom user. No, that's so okay. Are you trying to share your screen? I am trying to share my screen. But you hit Where? the green share screen button and then it's sometimes easiest, especially depending on what you might want to show. Um, choose the first option in your upper left corner. It should just say desktop. Um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of sorry. I'm stuck on a um, I'm not seeing the share screen option. Let me see if it's going to come it's on up. the oh, box. Okay. It's a green. There button. we go. I just had to get bigger, bigger than I thought I needed to be. OK, so I'm going to share my whole screen with all y'all. There we go. And Perfect. There we go. Thank you. OK, loving it. All right. Well, thank you so much for the nice introduction, Nicole. So I'm coming to you guys from not too far away. Um, so my home office is in San Leander, right next to Oakland. So I'm not too far from you guys. I cover the whole West Coast. So you guys feel close to me anyway. Um, so you guys have purchased Read and Write for the whole district. So all of your students and you have access to this literacy tool. There is no content at all associated with Read and Write. This is basically going to be a toolbar that lays on top of everything you do and makes it easier for you to communicate with your students and easier for your students to work independently. So um, I don't know, you know, how long you guys are looking at being in remote learning or some kind of combination of blended learning, but I think pretty much everybody here in California is in that that questionable zone. And this is something that will work for you regardless of whether it's uh, remote or hybrid or even in class. It's going to help your students. Um, so can you guys see my screen okay? I'm not going to make you watch a video, but I wanted to drop this in here. So so that if you wanted a quick overview later or you wanted to share this with some of your colleagues later you had like an easy way to explain it this is just a short like three minute video explaining how you would use read and write for remote learning just click there and i'll play the video for you um how many of you guys have actually installed read and write so did you guys get a chance to actually download it and install it it's actually force installed for the district awesome but okay. they have to make sure they only if you don't mind mm -hmm. um if everybody looks at Nora's screen, you'll see that in her Google slide, she has her profile picture to the right of the word share. Above that, she has the same exact profile picture in her Chrome bar. And so as, if those two match and you look to the left and you don't see the read and write puzzle piece, click you'll click on the gray extension to um, look in the list there and you'll see some push pins that you can use to turn it on. Actually, they don't need to go to the three dots. They can go to the gray puzzle piece to the left of your profile. Ah, circle. okay. If there's just gray, then they can. There's a little gray one right next to your your profile circle. Keep going. There you go. Ah, that was and if they click, if you click on that, you'll see that there's white and blue push pins. So if you're signed in with your San Juan account to Chrome, so you have that little picture up there that matches your San Juan picture, and you don't see read and write, the purple puzzle piece check to see if the blue push yeah, pin I took the is pin away yeah mm -hmm. yep okay sorry Good. about that yeah. that's just oh no <laughs> that's exactly why we're here we wanted to work for everybody um and so i took a little extra second to show you guys that um you do need to be logged into your chrome browser as well as into your google drive so just be aware that you could be looking at your gmail you could be looking at items in your google drive but not be logged into the Chrome browser, which means you won't have access to extensions like read and write. Um, and if this feels kind of, oh, that's a lot, I want to reassure you that your students are, on Chromebooks do not have to think about this, right? When your students open up a Chromebook, what happens when they open it? They can log in or they're pretty much walking around with a brick, right? Yeah. Um, so when your students log into the Chromebook, it automatically logs them into the, both the browser and mm -hmm. their Google Drive. However, so I just, mm -hmm. just the, the ones who have personal Chromebooks, we do have some of those kids, they log in with their Gmails yeah, because they don't like the filtering that we have in place. Okay. And so sometimes for the teachers in the room, you might have, if they say they can't see it, um, it might be because they're on a personal Chromebook and they're choosing to log that in with Gmail so that they don't have any video blocks or anything like that. And they actually need to switch that. They need to sign out of that on their Chromebook and sign in with their San Juan. The district owned Chromebooks won't be a problem. Yep. 
good. I'm glad we went through all of this. It's, it's kind of kooky, but you know, I mean, the district paid for it for the kids to use in the district. So they just got to be signed in. So easy peasy. So what the heck is read and write? So it's a toolbar that lays on top of what you're doing. Obviously it helps you with reading and writing. We're going to focus today on read and write for Google Chrome. Um, so that's the Chrome extension that we saw with the little purple puzzle piece up here. But I wanted you guys to know that your licensing includes access to all these different flavors of Read and Write. I don't think anybody's going to be using Microsoft Edge, um, but you might want to use Read and Write for Mac or Read and Write for Windows because those come with very robust scanning software. Um, if you have students with an iPad or you don't iPad yourself and you want to try it, you can download it for your iPad. And this link right here, you'll see a lot of my slides will have links to somewhere deeper to go. Um, this will walk you through the process of downloading the different uh, flavors of Read and Write and how you're going to do that. Uh, but we're going to focus today on the Read and Write for Google Chrome extension. And before we talk about it, um, I wanted to just kind of give you guys uh, we're going to try and do like a 30,000 foot view today and a little bit of time to practice. Um, but I wanted you guys to think about the why a little bit. So we're going to be able to read anything on the screen out loud. We're going to be your students are going to have ways to kind of uh, study. Um, you're going to have ways to support your student writing. But in general, when you're looking at the toolbar, there's some colored highlighters. And as far as I'm concerned, that's where the action's at. That's where the meat of the process is at. So I wanted to talk about how, um, I just want you guys to think about as we're learning about the tools, how we're gonna use these things to support practice and standard of masters, uh, practice and mastery of standards. So here we have a pretty basic standard, main idea in detail could be across different grade areas, different content areas. And you can see that the student was able to identify the main idea in pink with the highlighters and some details to support that with the green highlighters. And what's different, there's lots of ways you can highlight things on your screen, but you're actually able to pull these out into a separate, separate document. So after you highlight the text, you're gonna be able to click one button. And I'm sorry to interrupt. I have a problem. I can't see your screen. Oh, you can't, I'm sorry, let's see. I think I did something and I just don't know how to undo it. Okay. okay. Um, but you can hear her. So you still have Zoom. You just probably got it hiding. Did okay. you happen to open something like the slide deck? I thought, yeah, I thought I did, but now I don't see any of the, uh, the screen is like so small. I can't even see it. Uh, I can exit and then come back in and maybe that'd be easier. Well, sometimes it is. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll do that. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, yeah, no. Don't no worry. Um, so you see that the, um, yeah, some of you see it small, but the, the student identified the colors and they pull these out into a separate document. And sometimes people see that and think, oh, great, we're on our way to like a summary. But I want you to think again about how we can support our students in working independently. So um, for a lot of our students, it's hard to speak up. Um, I don't know if you guys are doing breakout rooms. Um, it's hard to know like what to contribute when you get into a breakout room or you're on a shared document. And um, this could be sort of like your sort of your own personal summary that you use then to um, to kind of guide your interaction with other people in the class. Um, so we can apply these to just about any standard. I have yet to see something that we can't make more explicit and engaging for students with those highlighters. It could be fairly complex. Like you could be looking at literature and maybe you're looking at uh, why the Montagues are angry in green and why the Capulets are angry in yellow and finding that supporting evidence. Or this could be as simple as, you know, if you're teaching, you know, first grade, you could identify the short A words in blue and the short E words in green. Um, so I want you to kind of keep an open mind as we look at those for some ideas about how you might want to use the tools. So what in the heck is this toolbar? Um, so it layers on top of whatever you're doing in G Suite. Um, so it works inside your Google Drive and the file types that it works with, this top bar that you see right here is what it looks like inside a Google Doc. The middle bar that you see is what it looks like inside a PDF. 
And the bottom bar here that you see is what it looks like on a website in the Chrome browser. So you can see just like the tools look a little bit different, your Microsoft tools look different than your Google tools. But generally, you know, if you know how to use a spell check or you know how to use a translate, you know how to use it. So once you've mastered one of the icons on the toolbar, it, if it's on the next toolbar, you already know how to use it. So the learning curve is not super steep. So um, it sounds like, let's see, we've got somebody to let into the meeting there. Um, it sounds like you guys are ready to do some hands-on practice. So I am on slide seven. And if you meet me on slide seven, you're gonna see a document here. And this is um, practice exercises. So if you click on this, it's in template mode and it's gonna make you a new document for you to do uh, whatever you want with. And we're gonna use this to practice learning how to use read and write. So everything that I'm sharing with you today is open source. I want you to feel comfortable using it with your students. I want you to feel comfortable modifying it, sharing it, use and abuse as needed, whatever um, you think is gonna help. So hopefully we're all on the same document. I'll give you guys a minute to get there. And this would be a great way for you if you wanted to um, train students. I don't know that I would go through this entire document with students, but if you wanted to train them on a couple of aspects of read and write, you could make a modified version of this document with just the part that you wanted to practice on. So basically what's going to happen is this document is going to walk us across the toolbar. And since this is the first time for you guys using the toolbar, you're going to click on that little purple puzzle piece up at the top. And you, my toolbar just automatically appears because I use it all day, every day. Um, for you guys, you may have it appear like a little, do you have like a little kind of a hanging tab there? You may have that. And if you click on it, now mine is just going to bring down my toolbar. But for you guys, since it's the first time that you're using it, it may pop up some permissions and you wanna make sure to accept those permissions. The district has checked everything out, it's safe. So just say yes to everything. Do you guys need a minute or so to get your toolbar up? Yes, please. Yeah, no worries. And I'm gonna drop in the chat link here. I'm gonna drop, uh, let's see. I'm gonna drop in the chat link, I have a little, video here. Let me just grab that link. And I'm going to drop that little video if somebody needs a little bit of extra support. I'm going to drop that video into our chat link. So let me get there. I'm sorry, how do we get this up again? I'm trying to... No worries. So once you have your Google Doc open, you want to click on that purple puzzle piece in the extensions. Okay, and so for me, off. it's just going to make it appear. But for you, you're probably going to have a little hanging tab that looks like this. And when you press on it for the very first time, it's going to ask you for some permissions. Can we go to that the slide deck and that's how we find slide seven? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Give you guys a minute to get here. And I just posted a video that I'll walk you through accepting those permissions if you need a little bit of extra help with that. So Nicole, if you wanna make sure that ends up on the recording, um, that'll help people, they can pause it and go from there. So Nora, I'm gonna go, uh-huh. Will um, students need to be walked through those permissions as well? They they will, and that video is there to help you with it. Okay. So, cause it's Google, good question. Cause it's Google, you can't just blanket accept permissions for them. Um, but as long as they're logged in appropriately, it should be pretty quick. And um, while you guys are, are working on that, I'll let you know, we have a very vigorous support site and Nicole has the links to all of this stuff. But if you ever have questions about it, you can go on our support site and be like, how do I accept permissions? And it'll give you either a video or a short walkthrough with screenshots. We usually have lots of 
help for that. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, working our way through this. Um, so the obvious thing that you're going to do with read and write is read, right? So I can click anywhere here in the document and I can press the play button and it's going to read it out loud for me. Claim pause stop. Sometimes your teacher gives a lot of directions in class and I, and I wanted to pause for a second because I wanted you guys to see what it's doing. It's lighting up the sentence in one color and then the word that we're hearing as it's going by in a contrasting color. And there's some uh, studies that actually go back to the 90s that show that when students have that coordinated audio and visual support, it helps them not only to pay attention and be engaged, but it actually helps them with their reading comprehension. So your average student who has that sort of following the bouncing ball is going to read and comprehend two levels higher on average than, um, than without it. And for students with disabilities, the average is actually five levels. So if you've got a kid in a ninth grade class that's reading at a fourth grade level, there's a good shot that they're actually going to be able to understand the ninth grade content. Question, question. Got a question? Okay, not seeing a question, but I'll mm -hmm. keep checking. Um, so I want you guys to have a little bit of time to play with that. You can see if I turn that off, I'll still see um, I'll still see it. I can change the voice and the speed. I went to my three little dots over here and I can go to my options and I can Sometimes. pick the voice. Awesome. Somebody's figuring it out. Um, I can make it faster and slower. Um, and I wanted to point out to you guys, there's all these different language voices. If I switch to the Arabic voice, it's not going to translate what's on the page into Arabic. It's going to read what's on the page with Arabic phonetics. So if it was already in Arabic, awesome blossom, it's going to sound great. Um, so for instance, if I were to change to this Mexican Spanish voice and I were to read this in English, it's not, it's not going to sound great. Right, she's using Spanish phonetics on English. If I were to choose an S document that was actually written in Spanish and have her talk, it's going to sound great. Um, and the English lady is going to sound bad. Uh, let's see. So here's an example. So now we're going to have her read in Spanish and she's going to sound great. So here we go. There's our toolbar. Según narra la leyenda, el sisimite, también conocido como el tacayo, es un... So that sounds great in Spanish, but we're going to take it back to English now. And we got to get down here to U.S. English for the one that we want. And there she is. And now she's not going to sound right in Spanish. -E See, it's just not quite right, right? Um, so I wanted you guys to feel comfortable playing with that. Is everybody here teaching in English or is anybody teaching in other languages? Is everything English? Well, in, it's Kristen here. Um, okay. <laughs> I have, I mean, I know we all have so many languages in our classrooms right now. We've got a third of our kids are from other countries and uh, English is not the primary language. So I know that the translating part will help a lot of our newcomers. Great. Okay. And can you remind me again where that button was where you could choose the language? Absolutely. So I went to my little three dots up here. Oh, okay. I went to my options. And then inside speech, here was my choice of languages. Mm -hmm. So just keep in mind, this is not going to translate for you. We do have full features in several largely used languages. So if I were to go over here and I were to change this to Spanish, did you see how this changed over here? I could change my functions to Spanish. And then I'm going to have a Spanish dictionary, Spanish word prediction, Spanish speech input. All of that would be in Spanish. Wow. So um, so know that like for some select languages, you can go all the way in there. we got a lot of French speaking users in Canada. We've always got a lot of Spanish users. Um, everybody's like Malaysian. Got to deal with the government of Malaysia. They, they like 
Google and web-based stuff. Um, so I think the next one that's going to come here is going to be Arabic. Um, but th those are sort of based on like how much people are using them with the tools. So we'll go ahead and take this back to English and keep everything there. But I just wanted you guys to know you got some some options there. Um, so pretty simple. Now that you know how to use it, you'll be able to use it on a website. You'll be able to use it on a PDF. It works pretty much the same. Um, and then when you're using the tools, you always want to kind of anchor yourself in the doc or on the website and then press the tool. Sometimes we want to press the button and then go into the document, but you got to tell the computer, hey, I'm looking at this word and I want to look it up. So you can either scroll over what you want to select, but if it's a single word, you can actually double click on it, which for me is easier. So I'm going to go to my dictionary and I'm going to get a dictionary definition that I can have read out loud for solar. I'll let you guys play with that. And now that I have the dictionary open, I can look up any word that I want to, and I can leave that there. So anybody that's teaching secondary, it's really nice to have that dictionary over on the side. And then anytime you want to look up something in a longer passage, it's there for you, which is awesome. Um, I worked in publishing for 15 years. And one of the reasons I left was because they just weren't sticking with the technology. Most of the publishers, while it's lovely that they use um, like a human voice to read the textbook out loud, they generally have them read the entire page. And if you want to look up a word in the middle, there's no pause button. You have to actually stop it, look up the word, and then listen to the guy from the beginning of the page all the way down. So I want to point this out because you may have to explain to your students that it's even possible because they've probably gotten used to not having that be possible. So we've got the dictionary open. And then next to the dictionary is the picture dictionary. So I can look up a word like solar, and then I can press the picture dictionary, and I can get an actual visual cue for that as well, which is Super good for ELs. Yeah, I can see you, Kristen. You're like, yep, going to use that. Um, and then as I move across the page, it's really easy for me to do that. I'm not going to make you guys do the whole exercise. She's asking you to cut and paste the definition and put it in the box. But what I wanted you to see is that the picture can actually be dragged into the document, which is super helpful. So um, for those of you that are teaching newcomers or quite frankly, I'm talking to a lot of people that just, you know, scheduling and directions and expectations need to be really spelled out as much as possible. Uh, right now, it's just everybody's brain is at maximum capacity. So anything you can do to help with organization is good, right? Um, so interestingly, what I'm going to show you was not taught to me by a preschool teacher, was not taught to me by a special ed teacher. It was actually taught to me at a conference. Um, a couple of disabled vets told me that they have memory issues and this is how they schedule their day. So you could say eight o'clock. Uh, we'll say eight o'clock. They have to use the alarm. Eight, 15. A thirty, right? And if I click on alarm, I'm going to get the picture. Boop, 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 boop. So I could actually make myself a visual schedule if I wanted to. Um, so that's something that's kind of cool to do right now. So if you wanted to make a visual schedule or some, you know some kind of like classroom routine or instructions that you wanted to add some actual visual support to, just drag that sucker right into your Google Doc and you're ready to rock. So that was the dictionary, the picture dictionary. Now we're going to go to one that is always been kind of interesting, but it's extra interesting right now um, because of all the remote learning. I'm sure you guys are experiencing um, I'm seeing a lot of families where mom and dad are both working at home and there's three siblings going to school at the same time and nobody has bandwidth, right? So sometimes maybe mom's got her important meeting at work and everybody just has to work offline. This is called the audio maker. And I had to have this explained to me, but that is that logo is a piece of paper wearing headphones. So this will take anything that you select on a Google doc or a website and when you click that button, it's going to take the voice and speed that you have selected. You see a little progress bar. It's making me an MP3 file of that. I can save it anywhere I want. So I could save it to a Google Drive folder that you could access offline. I could sync it with iTunes. So I could listen to it on a phone. Um, and it should open any second here. Let's see where it went. 
and then you're going to hear the reading. All right, well, she's still speaking in Spanish. We got to get her speaking in English, but you guys get the point. Uh, sorry, Paulina, it's not your time. And Ava's going to come back. So you can create, like if you know ahead of time that your kids have a really hard time getting online, then I would probably, you know, take some of your reading selections and maybe turn those into audio files that your kids could access offline. And that was the audio maker. This one is the web search. This is a soft, kind of a soft research skill. And it's that little globe with a magnifying glass. Um, at first, I was like, oh, I don't know about this. But honestly, it's a really good way to help students stay kind of like in the moment when they're doing some light research. And I'm going to select most watched 80s movies. And I'm going to click this. It's basically a one click Google search of whatever I have selected. And this is very interesting. Halloween is coming up. So I've been doing this, this example since COVID hit. And for a long time, it was Top Gun and then Dirty Dancing. And there's all this kid stuff now. Look at we got Halloween in here all of a sudden. So that's kind of interesting to see what like comes up, right? All these Halloween-ish movies and some anime. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But you get the idea. It's a good way to get a sort of a, an easy easy, um, easy general research thing kind of going. Now remember, I still have my prediction or my, my dictionary and my picture dictionary open and they're helpful in lots of ways. Um, so again, we can look, you know, as we're going down the screen. Um, one of the things that Nicole and I talked about that we thought might be super, super helpful for your students was the screen masking. And there's a bunch of different ways you can use it. The icon is a screen with a line through it. it looks like a monitor and when i click on it i'm going to get this screen mask and i've got this set up to be like very limited so if i was a student and i was trying to prepare for a quiz i could be looking at the questions and ask myself the question and then go down and go like oh not quite right right um, there are settings in here so i could change this i've made the background really really dark, but I could make it lighter like this, right? Um, I could change the color of the reading light to yellow. Um, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to change this to just clear and just have a yellow light, I could make that just like a little yellow line that was underneath everything. So lots of things that you can do. This is helpful for the students to pay attention. This is also awesome. Like, let's say you're on Zoom and you're talking about content on a website and you can be saying, okay, now when you get to the next paragraph and then you would like highlight either the whole paragraph or put a line under the paragraph, this is gonna help your students to kind of pay attention to what's going on on the screen, but it's also really helpful for them. Another way that I use this is when I have to do a list of things. Um, so um, I had, I was driving down the freeway and I got a chip in my windshield and I wanted to call somebody that would come out to my house and fix it. So I'm on Google and I've got a list of all the guys that come to your house and I'm like, okay, call that one. All right, call that guy. Now I call that guy. So there's lots of ways that you can use this. It's kind of handy as a productivity thing as well. Um, so that I think could be an interesting way to use it. Nicole, did you want to weigh in anything on that screen masking? You had some kind of cool ideas about the screen masking. Um, I don't know that I had anything cool, um, <laughs> but I just really liked, we know that students can sometimes uh, have difficulty focusing when there's a lot of content on a page. So you can, as she showed you, you can change the color, change the how high or narrow uh, the screen masking is and teach the students to be able to do that as well so that they can use it. Um, the only thing that Nora and I both did talk about is sometimes we really want to use it on something like a website because those tend to have some busier elements. Um, yes. And just know that when you do, oh, not the screen masking. Sorry, I was thinking of the simplify. Never mind. Yeah, let's We're go good. ahead and go there. Okay. Um, so <laughs> you're learning how to use these tools. Now you already know how to use several of these icons. I'm going to take you guys to a website. Oh, that's timely. 
Um, and this is a, like a children's news website called Dogo News that I like a lot. If we want to have the read and write toolbar, we're going to press the puzzle piece. And then the toolbar is just going to appear on the website. Um, come on. Let's see. Come on, come on. There it goes. And I can drag it around and put it on the side or underneath wherever I want. Um, and I can read stuff out loud. I can look up words in the dictionary like Monday, right? Um, so I can do all of that stuff that we've done already, but there's this simplify feature. So this is a, an educational website, so it's really not too bad, but we know there's lots of websites that have, you know, kids ads and blinky blinky things. Um, if you click here, the simplify page is going to take just the content of the article and put that all on one page for you, which is nice. There isn't a ton here um, in this particular article. And you know, this is not maybe ideal. You don't really care about that part. But um, there are some products out there that will um, take away the ads, but most of them strip the formatting. And this particular one doesn't have a ton of formatting, but sometimes, you know, when you have like a bullet list or you have like bolded paragraphs, a lot of time you'll tell students, all right, let's read all the bold parts first and then make some guesses and then we'll go back and confirm those by reading the content. Those things generally go away, but you can see those things actually stay in this text. But what Nicole was talking about, you can do this simplify, but you also have the ability to change the, the color. So if this is easier on students, I don't know why that would be easier. Whew. Um, this will also kind of help you to kind of hone in. So you got lots of options there. You can make the font bigger and smaller. There's a dyslexic font here that you can use. Do you guys know about the Lexen font in Google? No, I only knew about open dyslexic. Ah, I will tell you guys that the, the idea of open dyslexic is awesome. I am married into a family of dyslexics, but unfortunately the execution is yeah. not so good. No. It's home baked and there are many products that use open dyslexic that will make your computer crash. It's no es bueno. Um, but there is an awesome font in uh, Google. So you may not already have the Lexen font, in which case you want to go to more fonts, but look at the Lexen fonts from Google. I love them. So they just oh, nice. extending more and more space in between a sans serif font. It's awesome. So your kids can pick whichever one feels most friendly to them. Not everybody needs Zeta, maybe Giga is enough, right? Um, so they can pick the one that they like. Um, and then that's gonna just be everything in, um, in G Suite. It's gonna be legible and also like coded to work nice with G Suite. So I love Lexend, it is awesome. Nora, where's the simplify button again? So when you're on a website, this very last button on the toolbar, okay. the simplify page, okay? Okay. Um, so you guys already would know how to read it. There's two options for reading it. You can either select the text that you want and press the play button, right? Because it needs to know it's a whole website. It needs to know what you want to read. Columbus Day. We also have an option on PDFs as well. Um, this hover speech, if I click this, it's going to give me, if I'm not a strong reader, but I want to have that web experience where you just kind of bebop around and look at things. If I turn on hover speech anywhere that my cursor is. Columbus Day, which is commemorated why are killer whales ramming boats in Spain is. So I can just bebop around online with the hover speech, which is really nice. The dictionary and the picture dictionary work the same. Um, this icon right here, the screenshot reader was on your um, Google Docs toolbar, but honestly, if I use it once a year on Google Docs, that's a lot. Um, sometimes people post things online that are not accessible. So you can see I can select all this stuff here and it's great, right? But I'm guessing, see how I'm getting like a no-no symbol when I go over here? They hired a graphic designer to make that look really pretty and they saved it as a photo instead of like actual words that the computer could read. So what we use here is the screenshot reader. So I'm just gonna grab the part that says social studies and I'm gonna see what that says. I'm gonna grab it. We're gonna scan it and it's gonna be hard to see on the webinar. There's a, ooh, that's weird. Let's try that one. Also, let's try enter to win. There's kind of weird contrast there maybe. Let's try that. 
oh, there's something funky going on there. We'll find out. But let me do it on a, a regular piece so you can see what happens. Just... Columbus Day. And there's a replay button here so that if this was a testing environment, you needed to hear the question again, you'd have to scan it again and be distracted. Right. Um, so that's the, the basic stuff on the toolbar. Everything else on here is going to be exactly the same as the Google Doc. We can make a um, a recording of it, all of those kind of things. So that's going to be the same as the Google Doc. So I think one of the most powerful tools in Read and Write is the word prediction. Has anybody here used word prediction with students before? It is not what's on your phone. What's on your phone? Not that good, right? I have an ongoing gag with our PD manager where when we're texting each other, we just let it do what it's going to do. And then we're amazed at what we just unwittingly said to each other. Um, word prediction is much smarter than the autocorrect on your phone. So um, she's asking me to um, type out there are white clouds in the sky with word prediction. So word prediction is this little crystal ball. And when I press it, a list is going to appear over here on the side. And so you notice a couple things about those words. They're all capitalized. Why? Because I'm at the beginning of a sentence. They're all good words to start a sentence with, right? And you may also have noticed that I left my dictionary and my picture dictionary open. So now, in addition to hearing the word, I can hear the actual definition of it and I can see a picture. So the last thing in the world that we want is for students to have word prediction and you say, hey, I want you to write 100 words on X topic and they just click it 100 times. No, we want them to use word prediction to pick the word that expresses what they're trying to tell you. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this and it's just gonna go right in the document. Is and I'm gonna misspell white. Oh, white and community cloth, cloth, cloud, cloud. So we're an EL and we're not sure about plurals. Clouds. Oh, okay, that's the plural. And maybe I am not a super strong speller, so I'm going to spell S K I. Ski. Ooh. No, I don't want that above my head. So let me undo that and try again. Sky. Oh, yeah, that's good. And. So it really adjusts to your spelling. Um, it adjusts to where you're at. And some of the research that we've seen is that especially ELs, but also students with disabilities, when they have access to good quality word prediction, they are much more likely to use grade level academic vocabulary. And I use the same example all the time because I've seen it that much. A lot of people in kinder or first will do a unit on the hungry caterpillar. And the kids totally understand the caterpillar, they understand the cocoon, they get the transformation, they know it's a butterfly. And if you give them construction paper and felt pens and ask them to write something about what happened, you will get sentences like the bug got big. They know exactly what a caterpillar is, but nobody wants to be the first kid to misspell caterpillar. This takes that completely out of the equation, right? Um, so I wanted to show you, you can kind of see it's pretty good at a general level. This is very, very smart. What it's doing is it's looking at chunks of three words. Sometimes people try and break this by starting out with like one confusing word and it doesn't know where you're at yet. It's after you've done three words, a couple of sentences, it's getting pretty smart and figuring out where you want to be. So I've been writing like, a, you know, like a grade school kid. I'm going to trick the computer right now into thinking that I am a college student by using this big old fancy college student word, right? Now it thinks I'm super smart. Can you see how the like the word choices really changed? And so where these words are coming from is Google has a project where they're scanning all these books in the Library of Congress and they're creating a data set out of that. So that's where this is coming from. It can look at college level versus first grade. It can look at contemporary English versus Victorian English. It can look at like specific content areas. So now look what happens when I put a place in here between Israel. 
Look at my choices. Syria, Jordan, Egypt. So it knows what I'm talking about. It's not going to give your first grader like college level suggestions, and it's not going to give your college student a first grade level suggestion. It's pretty good at honing in on where you're at. And I think it's really powerful at helping students to stay on track. Now, do you want to use word prediction when it's um, word study time? Probably not, right? That's not an appropriate time to use it. But when you have a first grader that's trying to tell you something about science, heck yes, I want to know what they know about science, right? So that's one of the ways that we can support writing. Another one is talk and type. Um, and that talk and type is the little headset right here. And it's asking me what I had for breakfast. What did I have for breakfast? I had honey yogurt with cashews for breakfast. It was yummy. So, um, so you just talk right in there. If you guys are used to using the Google speech input, it's the same thing. Um, we actually wrote it uh, about three or four years before it came into Google. Uh, but if your kids know how to do it, they already know how to do it. And then last but not least on the writing, there's this piece here called check it. And it's that little check mark over here. So this is going to, you select where you have concerns or where you wanna review and you press the little check mark. And you saw that Google had some underlines. This is gonna go through and since purple is the read and write color, it's gonna underline any areas of concern in purple. And what we're looking at is grammar, spelling, and punctuation. So we're looking at things like subject verb agreement, plural endings. We're looking at, you know, typical spelling. We're looking at, um, you know, some construction stuff. So this is your writing conventions. And I know that there are programs out there that will go and automatically fix this for students, but we are an education company. We want your students to make a choice here. We're not going to just magically fix it for them, right? So we're going to press on this area. Did we mean this is, these am, that doesn't make sense. These are, oh yeah, I meant this is. And then you'll notice when we get in here, um, we know that students with disabilities and a lot of ELs, it's not so much a factor of like traditional misspelling. It may be an issue with auditory discrimination. So for a lot of students, the word school and scroll and skill sound really similar. So we want to give them a choice to make sure that that's what they meant, right? So you guys get the idea. You would go through here and finish. And then when you're done, you just uncheck that. So it's completely on demand. It's not going to add a bunch of annoying red lines that the students don't want to think about yet. It's there for them when they're ready to, um, to kind of review their work. So that was um, word prediction speech input and then check it are the big writing tools. But don't forget that once your students have written something, they can press the play button and hear it read back and it may look fine to them on the page, but when they hear it. This is how we start school. We start your reading, then Mr. Smith goes announcements, then we do the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, okay, we got some work to do, right? So that's useful. Another cool thing um, for writing is, remember we have our speech maker. Some kids, it does not matter, like they're sitting at the computer, as long as they've got the requisite number of words and they feel like they followed the prompt, they're ready to rock. And they just are not seeing where the issue is. For some kids, a neat thing to do is to take this hit this button and make it into a recording and have them listen to it, not even sitting at the computer. And then, you know, like, hey, did you like the way that sounded? Did that make sense to you? Do you think your friend could understand it? No. Okay, well, what do you want to change about it? So that's a neat little kind of trick that you can do as well. Um, this here is the highlight tools that we talked about a little bit, and they are, I think, the most powerful part of the program. This is where your students are really going to get into higher order thinking. In general, as you move across the toolbar to the right, it's kind of more higher order thinking. So I always like to see more of that as we go. Um, and so this is a great example of how to use these highlighters. Um, so she's asking you to find plants and highlight them in green. So I'm going to go through here. Boop, boop, boop. Maple is a plant, so it's going to be green. And animals are blue. I've got a blue dog, which is weird. And I've got a blue frog, which is also weird. Places are pink. So we got Hawaii. 
we got Alaska and we got Georgia and then colors are yellow. So yellow is yellow, but wait a minute, green is yellow, what? So she's kind of messing with your head a little bit about how this works. And then when you're ready, you're gonna hit this button right here, this collect highlights button. This is how you would erase a highlight, but I'm gonna hit collect highlights and I've got two options. I wanna choose color here, but I could also choose them in position order but I'm gonna choose color and I'm gonna say, okay. And this is gonna go make a new Google Doc in my Google Drive. And that Google Doc is gonna have everything separated out by color. So I can really see the categories. Oh, those are my colors. Yep, those are my animals, right? So this was a really basic example, but you could see this could be before the Civil War and after the Civil War. It could be anything, beginning, middle and end short A words, whatever you want. You could use this for anything. And now instead of you sitting on the other end of the screen telling the kids to notice things, they're actually you know, physically doing something to sort the stuff. And it's, it's pretty powerful. This one here is usually everybody's favorite tool on the toolbar. And this works on PDFs. This works on websites. This is my vocabulary tool. Anything where I have highlighted a single word it's going to use the dictionary and the picture dictionary to make me a vocabulary list. So I'm going to press vocabulary. It's going to go out again to my Google Drive. It's going to make me a new Google Doc. It's going to build a table. And the table is going to have the word from the dictionary, or the word, the definition from the dictionary, picture from the picture dictionary, and then a blank column over here. Kristen likes it. <laughs> Um, blank, a blank column over here um, to do whatever I want with. And this is awesome in English. We can hear it and everything. And we talked about how you might want to do this for your ELs. Um, Nicole, is there like a, a strong language group that really jumps out in your area? Uh, there's a few of them. So Arabic, Farsi, Dari, Pashto, Okay, Russian, let's Arabic. Ukrainian. That's why I was, I was thinking Ukrainian because, you know, I like to eat Ukrainian in your neck of the woods. Yep. Um, translate into Arabic. And in this case, it's going to make me a brand new Google Doc now with the exact same content, but in Arabic. Yay. So you guys can do this with any content you have. We know it's not rocket science. We know this is something that you guys do all the time. We're just trying to make it quick and easy and explicit and hopefully transfer some of that to the students. So it would be absolutely appropriate to have your students on a website reading and saying, um, gosh, you know, these are some words that I am not sure about. What does brutal mean? What does... Mm -hmm island mean right and then they could click that and same thing they're going to get their own piece so this is something your students obviously could do in class but if you wanted your students to do some more independent reading and come back to you and say what do you need help with here you go this is what they need help with right um, so that's super powerful. And then last but not least, if you want to get rid of any of these things, there is a, um, a, pay, a little broom here to sweep them away. If you want to sweep them away, you can sweep them away. So you guys saw the vocabulary list. And then this is another one that I think is really powerful for um, remote learning. This is a voice note. So if you like to use the comments in Google Docs, you're gonna like this one. If I press the voice note here, it's gonna open up a little bar for me. And she's asking me, what do I want to tell about my favorite food? It's kind of weird, but my favorite food is artichokes. I love them and I could eat them every day of my life. And I'm going to press insert and it's hard to see, but this is a little status bar that's going across the screen. Mm -hmm. And it's making an MP3 of my voice and it's going to put that MP3 into the comments section. Mm -hmm. So it'll take just a second here and then there's going to be a play button. Mm -hmm. Come on. It's kind of weird, but my favorite food is right. So, um, so you could actually, you know, put some directions or some encouragement for your students in there. And likewise, if they're not comfortable asking you a question in writing and they'd rather ask you the question verbally, they could put a comment in there and ask you the question verbally, which would be nice. Refresh my memory, Nicole, you guys are using Classroom exclusively, right? 
Um, primary grades use Seesaw. Oh, that's right, Seesaw, okay. So obviously you could link to this stuff through Seesaw if you wanted to. Um, you put some, you know, hot links. But um, the last but not least in here is the practice reading out loud, um, which is really awesome way for your students to practice the oral reading. So um, I'm going to select some text here. I'm going to press the practice reading aloud button. Um, this is kind of a preview of another one of our tools called uh, Fluency Tutor. So I can hear all of this read out loud and I can look things up in the dictionary just the same as I would. And then um, when I'm ready, I can click that record button. Once of the time far away, lived a magical teacher named Ms. Frost. She gave candy to all the students and let them take napes instead of homework and then when i'm ready i'm going to click that little send to teacher now i'm not connected to anybody in google classroom but if i was this would just send it to my teacher through google classroom if i don't have google classroom it's going to send them a gmail with a link to this recording right um, so that's an awesome way and then we talked about translate the translate in read and write is a single word translate so let's look at click and I've got it set to Spanish, but I can choose all those different things. If I wanted to translate more, I want to select and then go into those tools and do translate document, because what we want is for you to get the full impact of all of Google's research and get the latest and greatest from Google. So if it's more than just a single word, you want to actually go into the tools and use the Google Translate. So any questions about Google Docs? You guys pretty comfortable with that stuff? So you saw on the website that the tools work pretty much the same. I would say the number one question that I get on a website is why doesn't the word prediction work? Um, look at this website. Where would I use word prediction? Is it asking me any questions? No, no, it's not. So I can't use word prediction. So if you ever get in a pickle and you're like, oh my gosh, word prediction doesn't work, just go to Amazon. Amazon wants to hear anything that you want to tell it. If the word prediction doesn't work on Amazon, then yes, maybe you have a, an issue. But Amazon would love to hear from you anytime about anything, right? So here we go. Let me drag this down so I can see where I'm at. Right. So you can see it's pretty easy, but just give yourself a heads up like people are going to go what it doesn't work online. Um, so you've learned how to use both of those toolbars. The only thing left is what to do with the PDF. So I'm going to open a PDF that's in my Google Drive and then I'll show you guys how to get this to work um, with a PDF in um, in Google Classroom. And actually, Nora, as we had talked about since we use Cami with our PDFs. Yep. Um, can we actually go to the um, feature we were talking about last week where you can turn on and off some of the toolbar features for specific students or for specific Absolutely. Okay. We only have about five minutes left. Awesome. Let's go there. So I'm going back to our slides and this is the data desk. And remember everything I'm sharing with you feel free to dig deeper. There's all this information in here. This is something called data desk. You're going to want to go to this website right here. And there's two things that you're going to be able to do with data desk. One, I think is going to be really helpful to you guys for remote learning. So here we've got um, data desk. You go to the, the link there and it's going to ask you, do you want to collect your, connect your Google Classroom? And you're going to say, yep. And then what you're going to see is either your class roster for that class, or you may have multiple classes there. And you saw how we turned on and off options in the toolbar. So we went to our features. And if I want to get rid of word prediction, I just slide that off. But that's just for my toolbar right here. This is if you select a specific student or maybe your whole class, let's say from 10 to noon, you were doing word study and you didn't want your kids to have word prediction. Well, no problem. You would go in here and you would click on word prediction, turn that off and you would select from like 
two hours and then it'll be off for those two hours and then it'll come on again automatically after that. So you're going to be able to change your students toolbars remotely um, from far away, which is nice. And then the other thing that might be really helpful for you, if you want to see how your students are using read and write, you're going to be able to look for a whole class or you're going to be able to look for an individual student. Let me make this bigger. And you can pick the default is 30 days, but you could do a week, a month, a semester, however long you want to look at it. And you're going to be able to see not only like when they're logging in and using read and write. And this student has some pretty predictable peaks that would make me wonder if there was like a resource teacher on a certain day or something like that. And then you can look down here and you can see like which tools they're using, right? They like the text to speech, they like the dictionary. Um, so you're going to be able to see that. So maybe if you're doing an intervention, with your student and you're suggesting a specific tool that you want to use, that would be a great way to check in and see, are they using it? Does it correlate to, you know, like greater achievement or engagement for them? Um, so those slides are in there. And then I gave you guys a bunch of stuff to play with here. Um, this is um, a practice. So you can kind of get an idea how you could practice for the CASP with um, Read and Write. This is actually a CASP um, sample question that you can work through. Um, I know there were a bunch of EL people here. This is some ideas on how to make sentence frames with read and write. So your students could hear the beginning of the sentence frame and then either use speech input or word prediction to complete the sentence. And then something I've had a lot of questions about is graphic organizers. I had some school districts ask me if I could recommend an app that they could pay for for graphic organizers. And I was like, I don't know who Van is. I don't think he's still alive. You shouldn't pay for this. So um, this is, I made you two styles of graphic organizer. So um, the first sheet is the same graphic organizers in a Google Doc format. And then the second sheet is the same graphic organizers in a PDF format. And so um, this one is, pre, found this pre-COVID, but, um, but this is a cool one for kids working at home. Check this out. It's for a podcast, but um, you could change this to be, you know, like a movie that you watched or a website that you looked at. Um, so this would be a cool way. So there's all kinds of stuff in here. These are just templates. Use them, modify them, whatever you want. Um, there's all kinds of extra supports here for you. And one of the things that um, Nicole and I talked about was if you guys decide that you want to get deeper into how to get more stuff into Google Drive. Um, read and write Windows and read and write Mac have very robust scanning um, software that's attached to them. So if you guys are interested, I've been offering something that I call a scanning party. If you guys are like, how do I get my end of chapter assessments from the textbook into Google Drive and Google Classroom? Um, let me know, we can set up an hour. You guys just bring your stuff and we'll have a hackathon and figure it out. Um, so I know I gave you guys a ton of stuff here. We do have awesome tech support. You can reach out directly to them. Um, any questions before we kind of round things up today? Okay, well, you've got my contact information. If you guys, guys decide you want to dig deeper, Nicole, any words to the wise? Um, I just want to, first of all, thank you, Nora, for setting aside this time, especially at the last minute when it occurred to me that I should just, you know, have you do it. <laughs> all right. So thank you so much. This was Absolutely. really helpful, very informative. Make sure everybody, I will be putting this video up on the Distance Learning Hub and the slide deck will be there as well. Um, the other thing I will do is with uh, Nora's permission, if either A, if I send the link to you, Nora, or if you don't mind making me an editor, I would like to put the link to the video like towards the end of this where the resources are because I like to like, like I'll put the slide deck in the video description and I'll put yeah, absolutely. The, link to the video at the end of the slide deck. So no matter how people access the, re the support, they get both pieces. Yeah, um, so. For sure. Um, that way you'll have it. It might take me a bit. As some of you know, I'm doing six, we're doing six hours of training today. So I might not get to it today, but hopefully tomorrow <laughs> so that I can get those up into the distance learning hub. And that's also cross your fingers that it will let me edit the website because it's decided to have a hissy fit and I can't edit the website from home anymore. So, <laughs> but anyway, thank you all for coming. 
And um, please reach out with questions. You can reach out to Nora. You can reach out to me. If I don't know the answer, I just go to Nora. So <laughs> you can do whatever works for all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.